Okay, folks, let's get started. Uh, begin the South Atlantic State Federal Fisheries Management Board meeting. My name is Pat Gear um, from Virginia, and I am uh, the chairman. The first order of business is um, approval of the agenda. Are there any modifications to the agenda? Um, what we will probably do, letting you know, we're, since we're starting early, we're probably going to try to go right through this and then have lunch after we're done. That's the, the you know, we, we sh hopefully can get through this in the two hour period we have, but we're going to try to go through this as quickly as possible. And then um, if, we, if we're going longer, we'll, we'll break for lunch. We'll, we'll play that, you know, see how things go on that one. Um, hearing any changes to the agenda? Hearing none that um, approved by consent. Um, approval of the proceedings from the uh, May 3rd. Lynn? Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. I just noticed that in the proceedings from the last meeting, uh, there is under the index of motions, item three, um, the motion is listed as to reopen Maryland's commercial fishery for red drum. Um, <laughs> would love to have a correction for that. Thank you. Yes, thanks for pointing that out. And also that Georgia is still dear and you know, dear to my heart, but I am now in Virginia, so I am no longer the um, proxy for uh, the delegate in Virginia, I mean in Georgia. All right, moving on, um, any public comment on issues that are not on the agenda today? All right, hearing none, move on to item number four. And this is a consideration of the uh, traffic light approach for Atlantic Cro Croker and Spot. Um, we've been working on this for, you know, some time now, and, and Chris is going to give Chris Madonna is going to give a um, a brief overview of um, what they've been working on. So, Chris, you have the floor. All right. Um, I like the way you said brief. Okay, uh, I'm going to start off with the. We've seen a lot of this stuff you guys have seen before, so I'm going to start off with spot covering the regular uh, traffic light that we've been doing up to now, and then the uh, the regional approach. Um, so yeah, go ahead, next slide. So starting off with the uh, traffic light for the um, harvest and adult composite indices for um, the harvest composite, the top one there that uh, did trip in 2017, um, and which would have been second year in a row for that one. Um, and then the adult composite index did not trip in 2017. Um, since both of them didn't trip, there wasn't any management concern for that. Uh, at least for spot, the way that was done. Uh, next slide. Uh, the juvenile composite index um, indicated, which is, uh, this is um, using the uh, Maryland Juvenile Survey, um, didn't exceed the 30% threshold in 2017, but it would have triggered since it was uh, carried over from the two previous years that had, um, and these declines in the traffic light continue, uh, indicate uh, continued poor recruitment in the Chesapeake for spot. Uh, next slide. And for the uh, shrimp trawl discards, um, this is a late edition, wasn't in the report, um, but the uh, shrimp trawl discards also uh, didn't change a great deal from 2016. Um, the discard levels are still pretty low, particularly using that 1989 to 2012 reference period for the traffic light. Um, but a few things to consider, uh, next slide, is the um, both the Mid-Atlantic and South Atlantic uh, commercial harvest for spot continue to decline, um, although there was a slight uptick in the Mid-Atlantic compared to the South Atlantic. Um, and one trend you see with the Mid-Atlantic is you see a lot of year-to-year -year annual variability, um, which that points more towards stability issues. Um, all right, and then for next slide for commercial, or from sorry for recreational landings, um, the trends are a little more varied. Uh, but one thing to point out in 2017 was that the uh, Mid Atlantic uh, recreational landings were up quite a bit, uh, whereas the South Atlantic continued to decline. So, the um, summary for the traffic light uh, for the current method. Um, did not trigger in 2017 um, at the 30% threshold level. Um, and then neither the juvenile uh, fish or shrimp fishery survey would have triggered in 2017 as well, 
Um, but since they're advisory indices, they we're mainly concerned with the, uh, the harvest and the adult indexes. Now, for the regional, um, as the board directed back in the, uh, the last meeting, um, upon the recommendations from the technical committee looking at how to improve it, um, we were looking at uh, adding the CHESMAP survey um, as well as the, uh, let's see, and the North Carolina uh, DMF Program 195 uh, for juveniles, the CHESMAP survey being used for juveniles and adults. Um, but this, the regional metric approach was a little bit more um, in line with what we were seeing with harvest um, surveys and then also partitioning them by age. Um, and I'm not going to read all these, but that's essentially what we, uh, and then the, oh, actually, and then the last major change was instead of having um, triggering occurring of two consecutive years, um, it was recommended to triggering would occur if that uh, red proportion exceeds a 30 percent or more for two of any of the three terminal years in the index. All right. So for the regional um, TLAs, the uh, Mid-Atlantic uh, did trigger as well as the South Atlantic. Um, you, the traffic light pretty much shows what you saw in, the, uh, in both the harvest uh, figures where you've got a general decline, although the uh, harvest composite in the Mid-Atlantic actually was, um, had a lower proportion of red, but it would have fallen under, it would have tri still triggered in 2017. Um, and then the South Atlantic, you're seeing a more steady decline, which is indicated by those increasing proportions of red. Uh, for the abundance composites, the, compared to the coastwide one, the uh, Mid-Atlantic uh, did trigger in 2017 um, above the 30 percent threshold. Uh, and then for the South Atlantic, it did not trigger in 2017. However, the last two years have seen increasing proportions of red. It was above 30% in 2017, so that declining trend continued, or at least that indicates a declining trend. And the, uh, particularly in the Mid-Atlantic, um, the addition of the CHESMAP survey is really what's driving that increased proportion, but it does bring it more in line with what we're seeing in the harvest um, metric. All right, next survey. Uh, for the juvenile composite, um, in this case, we're still using, for the Mid-Atlantic, we're using the um, Maryland survey. Um, and it also did trigger in uh, 2017 and just illustrates that continued poor recruitment fifth year in a row it would have triggered. Uh, let's see, and that was it for that one. And then finally, the, the shrimp fishery, um, which isn't regional, that's just in the southern um, but the main difference on this one is that now it's using a 2002 to 2016 reference period, which gets rid of the really high levels of discard that were in the other reference time frame. And so there, has, there was actually a slight increase in the last couple years of uh, discards in the shrimp fishery, which is showing up in those increased proportions of red. However, in 2017, it did actually go down. Um, so to go over the summary for the regional um, traffic light, um, the harvest composite for both regions triggered in 2017, which did agree with what was happening the coast coastwide. Uh, the adult composite uh, triggered in the mid-Atlantic but did not in the south Atlantic. Um, and the juvenile traffic light in the mid-Atlantic still showed that pattern to decline. High proportions of red in both the harvest and the adult traffic light. Um, so at this point, uh, management response, moderate concern would be triggered under this for the mid-Atlantic, while no management response would be triggered for the south Atlantic. Um, so the regional TLA, basically bottom line is the um, addition of the other indices is giving us much better synchrony with the, between the harvest and the abundance characteristics within the traffic light. And with that, that's for spot. So we can take some questions on spot and then we can go on to Croker. Why don't we do that? Any questions for Chris at this point on spot? No, because I think the, the questions are probably going to be the same. Yeah, so all right. Moving on. Okay, moving on. Croker. All right. 
Um, same, f same format, we'll go over the uh, coastwide TLA and then we'll hit the uh, regional one. Um, okay, for, the, for croaker, harvest com composite um, continues to show the decline, did trigger in uh, 2017, um, would have been the fifth year in a row that is triggered for um, croaker. Uh, where, and the adult composite index, um, while it does have declining proportions of green, hasn't hit red yet, so it would not have triggered. Um, in 2017. So we're not seeing, you know, we're seeing disparity there between the two. Uh, for the juvenile composite index, uh, which in this case for Croker is the VIMS index, the juvenile index and the North Carolina Program 195, um, they actually in 2017 show completely opposite trends. Uh, the VIM survey was at one of the lowest values in, its, in, it, in the entire time series, whereas the North Carolina uh, survey was up, which is why you get that kind of just red and green on um, 2017. It was a bit unusual, um, but it did not trip. Uh, and then the shrimp survey, uh, and this is using that 1989 to 2012 reference period. Uh, shows a slight increase in um, recent years in discards, but we still haven't hit that 30% level. Uh, like with spot, we see a decline in commercial landings, both mid-Atlantic and the South Atlantic for uh, croaker um, that, that peaked in the early 2000s um, and basically just been in decline ever since. Um, most of the coastwide trends for commercial landings are driven primarily by Virginia and North Carolina where the bulk of the landings occur. Um, recreational landings show similar trends with both regions, um, although the uh, mid-Atlantic matches up almost exactly the same with commercial and for, for recreational, um, whereas the South Atlantic has a um, had peaks much earlier in the time series and has kind of, it has declined, but has kind of maintained a relatively, relative steady state since the mid 90s. Um, all right. So for the traffic light for the coast wide under the current management scheme, um, cons management concern was not triggered in 2017 for Croker. Um, and neither the juvenile composite or the shrimp traffic light tripped in 2017 either. Um, but you do see that high pattern, a pattern of high variability with juvenile croaker like you do with spot. Okay, for the, just like with um, spot, with the improvement recommendations going with the regional approach and northern, or excuse me, South Atlantic and mid-Atlantic as well as adding uh, additional surveys, the CHESMAP survey in the Mid-Atlantic and the South Carolina DNR Trammel Net survey in the South Atlantic. Um, the uh, age split between adults and juveniles, adults being fish two, age two, two or older. Um, same regional divide between the Virginia and North Carolina border. Um, updated reference period of 2002 to 2012 and then Instead of consecutive years for triggering three out of four in uh, Croker, it would be triggering any three out of four terminal years in the traffic light. All right, so for the Mid-Atlantic, um, actually Mid-Atlantic and South Atlantic, um, both triggered in 2017 and a continuing pattern. It's been triggering for the last couple of years matching up with that decline we're seeing in uh, landings both recreationally and commercially in Croker. Um, and one thing with the, uh, in recent years we're approaching the 60% level so it's, it's actually, those declines continue. Um, for the regional adult composite, um, the addition of the CHESMAP survey brought the Mid-Atlantic traffic light more into greater agreement with the harvest comp composite. You see the, um, the Mid-Atlantic did trip in 2017, which is following right in line with what we see with the harvest composite. Um, the South Atlantic did not trigger in 2017. It was actually um, over 30% in 2016, but in 2017 actually had gone up. That's mainly because the CMAP survey had, had, uh, had an increase. Uh, for the juvenile composite, um, 
The Mid-Atlantic Juvenile um, Composite did trip in 2017, and it actually um, was above 60%. It was actually because the value was so, the particularly for the VIM survey, um, the index value was so low. That's why that red proportion is so high. And then in the South Atlantic, uh, the juvenile index did not uh, trip, um, where you got a uh, slight, it was the increase in um, the, uh, the North Carolina survey, which we saw on the other um, coastwide as well. And finally, the shrimp fishery uh, did not, uh, did exceed 30% in three of the last five years, but it would not have tripped in 2017. But this, again, using, uh, using the updated or reference period of 2002 to 2016, um, that increase in the shrimp trawl discards for croaker um, is showing up as the higher proportions of red in recent years. Uh, so for the regional croaker summary, um, the harvest composite triggered for both regions, um, agree, again agreeing with the coastwide TLA, um, and then the adult and juvenile composite characteristics triggered in the mid-Atlantic, um, but did not in the south Atlantic. So again, we're looking at a, a moderate management concern that would have been triggered in the mid-Atlantic, whereas it would not have been triggered in the south Atlantic. And. I know I went through that rather quickly, but um, take questions on both, I guess. We can go through it. Any questions for Chris? Roy? Just trying to wrap my head around the results. And thank you for the report, Chris. It would appear that the, and there's a concern over both Spot and Croker for the Mid-Atlantic region. Is that a fair summary of this analysis? Uh, yes. I mean, there. The next obvious question, obviously, and, and um, this is for this board to decide, is what, if anything, do we do about it? Um, we all know that both of these species are prone to large fluctuations in their abundance and natural events may, may be a driver in, in these fluctuations and probably are uh, events beyond our control. So the question is, how extreme does it have to get before we take some management action? And, and would management action even benefit stocks like Spot and Croker? Uh, those are just some questions. And, and, and I know, uh, well, I, I'd appreciate any advice from the technical committee in, in this regard, any advice they could give to the board. And I have Lynn. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I was, I was one, and thank you for the presentation. Um, could you talk a little bit about, because we have this issue where, especially with Kroger, we've tripped in the mid-Atlantic, but now at the South Atlantic, I know there was some conversation um, in the TC that if the mid-Atlantic would take action, the South Atlantic should follow suit because there's some movement of the fish between the areas. I was just wondering if you could offer us some clarity on that. Yeah, um, that was a that was quite a point of discussion with the technical committee as well as the um, plan development team or plan review. Well, plan, development. plan development team. I get them all mixed up. Um, anyway, um, and. It, we did feel that trying to, you know, if, if it was triggering in one region and not in another, to try and impose, you know, it, or make management recommendations just for one region would be difficult. So that if things were done, you know, some, some type of management guidelines, whatever they end up being, um, were done, it would really, we would think it would probably encompass both the South Atlantic and the Mid-Atlantic. Um, because it would be a lot easy to a lot easier to oversee, um, and some of those trends, as you pointed out, um, the, um, the 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 environment. Some of them, particularly croaker, seem to be um, or indicate that it's more likely. It, some of it's environmentally driven um, for these long-term cycles, particularly when you look at the real long-term commercial landings. Um, and you know, with that in mind, we're actually kind of right in the middle of a down period, and that. Of, of the 
for Croker. Um, and so whether if we do something now, and I think this is going to be addressed um, coming up with the, with the plan development team recommendations and stuff that actually directly address that. So, but yeah, those are things that we've, we've been uh, wrestling with. Anyone else? <clears throat> Roy? I mean, John. Look at that. You got mistaken for Roy Miller. That's, that's pretty <laughs> impressive. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Chris, I was just curious as to whether these big fluctuate, these long cycles with both these species have been looked at in relation to uh, like the Atlantic multidecadal oscillation or the NAO, because I know um, in Delaware they did some work with it on weak fish and saw some pretty interesting correlations there. Uh, yes, they, there has been some, there have been a couple of studies uh, done by John Hare looking at, uh, particularly with croaker, not so much with spot, um, in uh, changes in um, population levels with overwintering temperatures in the NAO. And so um, that, actually one of the recommendations that is going to be covered with, uh, with the plan development team recommendations um, was to ex further examine um, and try and model some of the longer term trends as something of a prediction tool with 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 the surveys as well as some of these things and being able to draw in but that's a it's kind of going above and beyond um, but yeah that's certainly on the table to look at we're kind of moving right in right right into our next agenda item so um, I have a technical question to ask of Chris um, I know the Vims trawl survey had a major vessel and gear change starting in July of 2015, were they accounted for? Were those adjustments accounted for in the numbers? I believe they were, because they had a, they, the last two years when they had to do the survey, they, it, it took longer because they had to kind of bring it back to the previous, whatever, adjusted units for their conversion. Um, Did you see that drop? Just yeah. Are there any any other questions about the data, um, or technical questions for Chris? Hearing none, we'll move on to um, our next agenda item, which is um, concerning postponement of the motion from the addendum. And um, Mike is going to give a presentation of uh, the PDT's recommendations for potential response management triggers. Thanks, Mr. Chair. So in the last uh, South Atlantic Board meeting, a motion uh, was postponed. Uh, it was a motion to initiate an addendum to the Spot and Croker Fishery Management Plans that would incorporate the new traffic light analyses as well as uh, management response to triggers from those analyses. Um, in the aftermath of that meeting, a plan development team, a uh, joint species plan development team was populated and um, and they started looking at potential management responses to uh, the TLA updates. And the initial guidance coming out of the meeting was uh, that they would try to look at what responses would achieve a percent red of 35% or less. Um, as we got into some of the, uh, some of the discussions, the, uh, the team interpreted that the board direction for the percent red was applicable to the abundance index rather than the harvest. Um, achieving a, a lower proportion red of harvest would mean that we would need to harvest more. Um, so we were interpreted that to uh, be applicable to the abundance index. Um, but one difficulty that, uh, that the PDT ran into was uh, the lack of a relationship between the harvest and abundance, which is the entire motivation for the tasks that they were given, as well as uh, the lack of any well-defined stock recruit relationship with either of these species. Um, that, that makes it very difficult to try to get any reasonable prediction of an increase in abundance that would result from a harvest reduction. Um, so there was a, more of a, a larger goal that the, the PDT wanted to achieve in that um, they wanted to establish some type of management for these species to begin with, rather than uh, shooting for a certain percent red. 
and uh, it's been mentioned already looking at the uh, looking at the landings history for Croker especially uh, these these cycles of high and low harvest throughout the history of the fishery um, we're clearly in a, a low point of the cycle and the overarching goal that the PDT has is is that um, while we're at this low point we don't want to have the stock be fished to the point that it can't recover again um, so while we recognize that the the low fluctuation isn't necessarily due to the fishing we want to still have the the stock at a point where it can recover as it has in the past um, and w along uh, those lines um, there we're thinking more uh, more about measures that the fishery can kind of deal with as long-term management measures that would uh, continue to have this position established and they be reevaluated after they're put in place uh, for croaker after three years and for spot after two years in accordance with uh, with what is spelled out in the TLA addenda for those species so once we got into discussions about what types of options uh, from a regulatory standpoint would be at at, um, at the at our disposal and and could be potentially implemented uh, seasons were one of the uh, one of those that was uh, given some consideration as well as trip limits in the form of either vessel or bag limits um, size limits would be really only applicable to croaker um, spot just the way that the fishery is executed and uh, the biology of the species the the size limits may not be as useful for that um, but those are some of the options that the PDT recommends the board consider um, in including in a potential management response to the triggers from the updated TLA. Uh, there are there is some precedent for these types of uh, regulations at the state level. There are some states that have implemented bag size possession limits and seasons for croaker. Um, as well as creel and aggregate bag limits for spot. So there is uh, some, a uh, couple reference points that we could look at at the state level um, then considering the, the coastwide management response. Um, the other uh, point that the PDT wanted to make was the consideration of a coastwide management response to the regional triggers. Uh, we need to keep in mind that the that spot and croaker are both single stocks along the coast they're not divided at the virginia north carolina line the regional approach to the tlas is an artifact of the survey sampling it's not um, a construct of the of the biological stocks or the assessment stocks so these are not distinct populations therefore any type of action any type of downturn in in one and action taken in one area is going to have effects um, in the other region as well in addition there is an overlap of the fisheries among states there's been a lot talked about um, particularly with uh, fishermen crossing over between virginia and north carolina and and fishing croaker on either side of there so because of the connections between the fisheries in the regions uh, there's also some motivation for a coastwide response um, if we want if the board wants to have consideration to the specific regions and how uh, local fisheries are conducted um, the PDT would recommend uh, consideration of some type of regionally apportioned TLA response and we included an example in the in the memo that we uh, that we submitted for supplemental materials uh, that example is if the long-term management regime uh, that was established were a hundred pound trip limit and there were a trigger in the mid-atlantic uh, during under that regime then a potential response would be an 80 pound trip limit so a 20 pound trip limit reduction in the mid-atlantic and a 90 pound trip limit in the South Atlantic, so a 10 pound trip limit reduction there. Um, and this, this isn't to indicate any type of actual numbers that would be applied, but more of the, the idea that if there were a regional trigger, there could be a stronger response within that region, but there needs to be some type of coastwide interaction to take into account that 
the, these fish and the fisheries themselves are connected throughout the coast. Um, and then one final point um, that the PDT discussed, I didn't really include it here because it's not particularly relevant to the addendum, but they did discuss um, that there may be some use in the long term of considering some type of workshop or something uh, to look at those environmental fluctuations relative to the abundance and consider um, if there's possibility of an environmental forecasting type of model based off of uh, the North Atlantic Oscillation or um, some, some other environmental, uh, environmental metric. So getting back to the, uh, the addendum that was uh, postponed from the last meeting, uh, I just wanted to provide uh, an idea of a timeline. There's been some, uh, in discussions I've had with board members, there's been some interest in getting a little bit more public input on, um, on this addendum. And uh, from the standpoint of uh, how that would be conducted is um, there's a potential that states could hold their own public hearings or they could solicit input from their own stakeholders and then kind of send that to the plan development team um, for us to incorporate in a draft addendum. To give a little bit more time for this type of process to happen, uh, I've um, developed two different schedules um, for this addendum, a faster and slower track. Um, and the difference would be one, uh, one meeting period. So we would either have uh, final board action in February or May of next year, depending on the board's direction and um, whether states want to solicit that public input uh, on their own. The commission would still um, attend and hold public hearings after the draft addendum is approved for public comment. Um, that would occur depending on the track either in October of this year or February of next year. And so just uh, as a review before uh, the board votes on the, on the postponed motion, uh, I just wanted to put kind of a summary table here um, that highlights the differences between the current TLA and the proposed new TLA. And those are shown in bold um, in the various categories of the new indices that would be incorporated, um, the age structuring that would be incorporated, a new reference time period, the updated triggering mechanism, as well as now uh, with, uh, with what Chris has shown you, you see the, the TLA result for this year using the current versus the new, uh, the new method. And with that, I can turn it back over. Thank you very much, Mike. Thank you for doing this for us. It's nice to have that. All right. Um, this is the motion that's on the, that we postponed from last meeting. But I want to, first of all, if there's any questions for Mike. I see several hands going up. Chris? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, and thanks for going through the, the, the potential process, Mike. That's very helpful. In terms of coming up with uh, management options uh, relative to trip limits and seasons. Um, what I mean, you, you gave a, a general timeline for you know, the development of, of a potential addendum. What, what uh, kind of timeline do you expect on the plan, for the plan development team to, to put options together? And I guess how, um, I guess what level of detail or is it maybe a question for the board? What level of detail are we looking for for options such as trip limits and in, in, uh, in season, especially if you know, we start looking at this at, at a state or regional level? That's something that I think that I would probably ask um, for board member input, and board members would probably, from uh, a couple that I've talked to, would maybe. Uh, that that was part of the motivation for them wanting to get a little bit more public input because we're we're not trying to have a necessarily a drastic harvest reduction that's not necessarily what's being recommended here but to have some type of management in place that constrains harvest so that the fishery is put in a good position for the population to 
come back whenever conditions allow. Um, but at the same time, you know, to have some something there that um, that the fishery can deal with, um, that the fishery can survive on. And I have Krista and Lynn. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I'll apologize since I haven't been part of the conversations um, in the past. I just want to make sure I understand. So this motion um, and then the PDT recommendations, um, the PDT recommendations were to include long-term management into the addendum in addition to potential management triggers. Is that correct? Yes. So since this motion was from the last meeting when we didn't have that PDT recommendation, does that motion include those long-term management measures as well? So one of the, uh, one of the items that we were tasked with was, you know, we had the mindset of what can be done, what changes can be applied to this fishery and, and the PDT were of the mindset that long-term management measures would probably be more beneficial than necessarily anything that was trying to be applied in a short term. Um, as far as whether that is part of the motion, I might have to look for guidance on that. I'm sorry, Mike, I was having a sidebar conversation with Caitlin about some, about a compliance As report. far as whether, um, the recommended long-term management that was not available in the last meeting would inherently be incorporated into this motion. I think the board can decide um, here today if you would like to include that and that can be added and it would be on the record here today and you'll be fine. Okay. Um, then I have um, Lynn. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, so, uh, and, and Mike, thank you. C could you go back to the slide that outlines the timeline that you had up? Um, and, and I'll say that I was one of the people that I had uh, great anxiety over um, the idea of implementing management measures on a fishery like spot that's never been managed um, through an addendum. Spot is a really big deal in our state. It is fished by many different, often conflicting sectors. We already struggle a little bit to um, smooth those waters. So it's gonna require some pretty hefty public outreach on our and, and I recognize that an amendment probably isn't the right thing to do here, but we're gonna need that time, um, I think, to get out to our stakeholders. So just to, just to be clear, if we choose to pass this motion today, the states would go out and have those meetings um, with their people. We would bring our management ideas submit them to the PDT and they would develop an addendum with our management options for board review in February. That would then go out to public comment and we would approve in May. And I think that's fine, but my, my one concern is because these initial hearings that we would do as states with that, they wouldn't be ASMFC hearings, they would be us talking to our states. We need to make sure amongst the states, I think that we have a consistent message. And I think your, Mike, your point that what we're looking for is, we're not looking so much for reductions as we're looking for a break. Um, we're looking for a, you know, just a, a cap on where we're harvesting so we're not, the fisheries aren't growing. So maybe what we need, is there, could you provide to us, does, would it make sense to have a table of all of the states, I looked for this for spot, a table for what all of the states have. So in Maryland, in terms of regulations. So in Maryland for spot, we have nothing. But Virginia has, I don't know what Virginia has. So maybe it would be something that we could propose to our stakeholders 
that we match Virginia or Virginia match North Carolina because I have a little bit of a concern that what I don't want to have happen is to have all the states come back and have very disparate ideas of what they can you know what they can stomach in terms of a regulation so I'm looking for some way to get some consistency and some equity and maybe the start there is to just have that understanding of what everybody already has in place so maybe we can try to find some consistency thank you those regulations for Croker are in the FMP review which is in our um, packets that we have that's in the end for the review this year now there aren't any for spot as you said then that's the issue I don't I don't know if there's any regulations for spot does anybody have regulations for spot the, uh, South Carolina has spot in an aggregate bag limit and an, I believe there's a creel limit for Georgia is that correct yeah but wow. that's it but I mean, if you're interested, that those those regulations for Croker are in our information packet that we have. Follow up, Lynn. Yes, thank you. So I, I guess I'm still I'm still interested in getting some. I know that I'm getting in some feedback from the PDT or from the technical group that these long-term measurements. So I think what your words were is we're looking for long-term management, not necessarily a reduction how do we how do we ask that question to our stakeholders how do we couch that to them you know when we say okay management's coming on spot what's that going to look like do we say we are going to cap harvest so by our estimation harvest is going to be is won't be able to increase over the next five years i'm just trying to understand how we how we give them some box of what those management measures might look like hey, tony I'm, I was going to address Lynn's other question before. I think that, one, Lynn, you're correct. We should probably give, make sure that everybody's using the same information or base information. I think Mike can provide to each of the states the information on the traffic light and then tables for what each states have for regulations so that you can start with those. And then I, you know, when you and I were talking earlier, I was envisioning these state hearings to sort of give the PDD, PDT some additional information from the fishery or from the fishermen about sort of what types of management might be feasible to them um, or, you know, what their vision is in terms of uh, getting at addressing the concerns that we have in this fishery. Um, I don't know if it, and I would turn to you to say, all of you, and ask, do you have to put them these questions into a specific box or not? Or can it be a little bit open-ended? Um, and I, I don't know. Lynn, follow-up? I think, I think the nature of how open-ended our hearings are depend on how specific we want those options to look in this addendum. So if this addendum is going to have options, for example, trip limits of 100 pounds per vessel per day, then that's a very specific and could be a Armageddon option for some states and not, not for others. But if the option is going to look more like implement a trip limit such that I don't know what such that something happens, then that's, that's open-ended. So I'm trying to understand what level of detail those options are going to look like in that final addendum so that we can guide our people to give us the input to create those. Any additional discussion? Chris and then Krista. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, from, from Lynn's comments, uh, I guess a thought I have on how to frame this for the hearings uh, is I think for the technical folks in our state to you know, do, do some uh, work on looking at what the average catch per trip is or the range of uh, landings per trip just thinking about like the commercial fishery uh, and the different commercial fisheries to get a sense of of what what the 
w what are we dealing with today? I mean, we, we see what the landings are, but uh, you know, I think we're, we're really trying to get to is with trip limits is what what is what's the fishery? How's the fishery behaving? What are they catching right now? You know, because it could be a, a, a situation, probably a situation where uh, a one size fits all trip limit won't won't uh, achieve what we're trying to do we don't want to you know, turn landings into discards uh, you know in, in this in this exercise at least try to avoid it as much as possible so uh, th there may be some work that needs to be done ahead of time just by the the technical staff from the states uh, before we go out to public hearings give the fishermen there's something the public something to to, to work from uh, you know we don't want it too prescriptive, as, as Lynn talked about, you know, just you know, saying we're thinking about this this trip limit. But at the same time, we don't want it too open-ended either. Uh, it's just trying to find that happy medium uh, is is the challenge we we, we face right now. Krista. So I think Florida might be in a little bit of an unusual situation, at least with croaker, um, not having any species-specific regs for that for croaker specifically. Um, I don't think we have them for spot either, but I'd have to verify that. Um, I'm having a really hard time wrapping my head around um, implementing long-term management measures for a species that we don't currently specifically regulate um, and when TLA measures are not being tripped. Um, so I wanted to put that on the record. I'm, I'm a little bit uncomfortable with that. I'm certainly uncomfortable with any fast tracking of that in the timeline um, if long-term measures are going to be implemented. Um, without having the data in front of me, I have no idea if the, um, you know, the per trip landings are very consistent or if they're incredibly variable, things like that. Um, so I'm certainly uncomfortable with fast tracking that and I'm relatively uncomfortable with including long-term measurements without looking at the data a lot more before we figure out what those could potentially be and talking to people about that. Robert and then Roy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, just maybe for the board's um, knowledge, I wanted to share kind of what South Carolina's motivation was for our spot croaker. We we had a we we put basically a backstop management measure in place, um, really with a lot of support from our constituents, who were looking at um, you know potential exploitation, you know, large variability year to year in that exploitation and came to us and said, hey, don't you think we ought to have something in place? And so we've got a relatively modest 50 fish aggregate bag limit on spot croaker and whiting um, and really was, was designed really just to be a backstop, not necessarily in response to any management issues. Um, and that got, um, you know, favorably received by our General Assembly. So just for the board's edification, just know that was kind of our thinking when we went down this road several years ago. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. And Roy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm, I'm thinking of things that we could do today. And, and just to kind of take off on the idea that Krista proposed, perhaps I, I see this as a, um, these two species as ones of concern for the Mid-Atlantic, but not necessarily a crisis. Therefore, I see no compelling need to use the fast track approach using that uh, diagram up on the before us now. And so I, I think we could, we could eliminate that and consider a slow track approach. Now, wh what we should do is, is the next question, but I think we need public input as to what management mechanisms are palatable, uh, would not put people out of business, uh, would be conducive to uh, furtherance of these stocks, and, and I'm still struggling for what, frankly, what those management uh, measures should be. I, I kind of like South Carolina's model of, of backstop aggregate limits. It, it sort of reminds me that it, of the old maxim that if you maximize the amount of eggs in the water, eventually good things are going to happen, that environmental conditions will be favorable and your class success uh, will benefit. And beyond that, I'm groping for specifics. Um, 
I like the idea of seeing on one one document what everyone's size limit or and or season or or bag limits are. That that would be helpful, and, and maybe we can go from there. Thank you. Thank you, Roy. Are there any other comments? All right. Well, we have a motion that we you know postpone this, and we have to take care of that. And I'm hearing. In general, people want to slow things down. So I see two hands go up. I see Robert and then I've got Brian. Mr. Chairman, just a, a question for staff. What does it look like when we are kind of going down this road where we're kind of casting about for answers, not really sure we want to do an addendum or amendment, um, but we really do want to get feedback on kind of what the potentials are can can y'all help us you know have we been down this road with other species before um, you know trying to engage our constituents and stakeholders with a hey what do y'all think this is what we see um, can staff it, it, can can they prescribe something for us to, to chew on Tony I mean I think you know what you're looking or describing is scoping right and well, yes, we can do scoping through an amendment process. A lot of times we don't get the feedback that you all get when you hold hearings or smaller group meetings with your states. And so when I was discussing this with Lynn, I we talked about this alternative path, not because we're not trying to do the work, but just that we haven't, you know, a lot of the public hearings that we've been having, people haven't been showing up. Um, and so if we're looking for some real feedback from industry and the fishery, I thought we might be more successful in having these state meetings to come back to us. Um, I think that, you know, in terms of the process of what we do here, if you all are not comfortable initiating an addendum until you've gotten that feedback from the public, that's certainly fine. I, I don't think that it's, Problematic. You can get that feedback and then come back to this board and determine how you want to move forward, um, and and we can go from there. Brian and Adam. My question is very similar to Robert's. I was curious about the quality of the public comments through the amendment process, um, and I'm sort of surprised as a new member at the lack of public comment at these proceedings. Um, I know how much we debated the actions <laughs> that are taken here on a state level at our VMRC. And um, I would imagine at these various jurisdictions you have the same type of debates that we do, very vigorous, but not seeing it here. Um, and I think the public comment process is a very important one when you're talking about initiating management where there's not been management. Um, so I, I, I wouldn't mind seeing, I guess, a timeline, a similar timeline with an amendment process, but it may not be a significant difference from what I'm hearing from Tony uh, to go that path. Um, I don't know if that's very helpful to the discussion, but I wanted to bring it up. Okay, I had Adam and then Joe. So just looking at these, I understand what staff was trying to do in providing this table. Um, from anybody listening to this conversation though I'm not really sure this is from a perception standpoint we're talking about fast tracking or slow tracking anything here the fast track is pretty much a normal addendum schedule so in this case it's the fastest track but I wouldn't really say it's anything expeditious from a perception standpoint nor do I think the slower track is necessarily a slow track allowing an extra meeting cycle to go through is not uncommon in anything we go through in these deliberative processes so from that perspective you know again for anybody listening I think either of these aren't fast aren't slow one just allows for more deliberately more deliberation where I think we're struggling with though when we go back to that motion that's before us right now is it was really a two-part motion 
we had information brought forward to us about incorporating some new pieces to the traffic light analyses that I think we're pretty much all in agreement we want to use and want to see go forward. What we're struggling with, though, is then how quickly we need to craft and enact the management responses. So building on what Tony just said, if we want to not initiate this addendum, vote this down, withdraw it, whatever the process would be, I think another potential path forward here might be to move forward with an addendum purely on the basis of incorporating those new TLAs that we want to use so we have them available to us and use that time frame to work with our constituents on considering what management responses might be and take that up as a separate addendum next year. Joe and then Robert. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I you know, um, I, I don't have any issues with, with uh, the, the timelines discussed, uh, if it is a slow track. One thought for me being part of this process for a long time is um, we, we tend to forget that SPOT doesn't even have a technical committee and it's, you know, really just part of an omnibus amendment. Um, I think issues are here to stay for a bit. I think management action is, is going to be needed at some point. I think it may be appropriate to start moving on that. Uh, I certainly see a lot of overlap, and I, <clears throat> I wouldn't be opposed to seeing SPOT in the Croker FMP. Um, being the only state that sits on both the South Atlantic and the Atlantic Herring section, which is soon to become a board, uh, there was talk about what may be a great bait crisis with the loss of Atlantic Herring coming forward. And I definitely, without question, see ripple effects uh, for the South Atlantic and, and, and Spot and Croker fisheries with that bait crisis. So. Thank you, Joe. Robert? Mr. Chairman, I think I'm ready to make a motion. If you're ready to receive one. I'm not seeing any other hands go up. Hmm, okay. You have the floor. Oh, man. I would move to amend the postponed motion. Is that in line from a parliamentary perspective, or do we need to deal with this postponed motion first? A substitute, excuse me. Yeah. Go ahead, Bob. Yeah, I think parliamentary, you know, that the postponed motion is the motion that's before the board now, so treat that as just a, a motion that was made today, if you want. So, you know, if you move to amend or move to substitute, anything you want to do is, is uh, you know, available to this motion, Robert. Robert. Mr. Chairman, I would move to amend that motion by striking the words of the postponed motion and management response to those analyses. In other words, the move to initiate an addendum to the Spot and Croker FMP that incorporates new traffic light analysis. And if I get a second, I'll explain. Second by Lynn. Mr. Chairman, I, what I'm thinking is that, you know, we've got a recommendation um, from the TC to look at the new traffic light analyses to incorporate that. Um, in these plans, um, and it strikes me that um, we could use some discussion with our constituents back home on terms of potential future management. And so it, the way I look at this is simply an addendum to update it with the new traffic light analyses um, and then to give the rest of us time to go home, talk to our constituents and say, look, um, this is what we're seeing coastwide with respect to these species what do we think we need to do? You know, South Carolina has moved, Georgia has moved to initiate, or we've got management measures in place now. Um, maybe other jurisdictions might want to consider that. Um, and then maybe we can get back on the same page. So my intention is to just simplify this um, uh, with respect to updating with the, uh, the new traffic light analyses. Okay, um, Lynn? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I like this approach and I, I like this idea of simplifying and separating what I want to make sure, especially given, you know, Joe's point about the 
what's happening with herring and other bait issues. I want to make sure we're not, there's a balance here, you know, we don't want to drag our feet. So I think when once we go down this road, we need to really make that commitment amongst ourselves that we are going to go back and have these conversations with our constituents. Um, and I really like the idea of, of, of figuring out for each of our states what that backstop would be, what's a tolerable backstop, and then having that discussion here um, so we can figure out uh, what to do with that information. Thank you. Um, Mike and then Tony. Um, just a, just a, I guess a reminder or kind of a, of what the implications of simplifying the motion would mean. So should an addendum go through that only incorporates the new traffic light updates? Um, the same management responses that are in the current addendum, uh, it would be addendum, I think it's two for uh, Croker and one for Spot, um, but the same management responses would still apply. And as written right now, those are rather vague as is. So those are things that would need to be addressed probably in fairly short order because what's going to happen is should should the you know should this motion pass and the uh, addendum go through and we incorporate the new TLA next year when we have the TLA update uh, there's going to be management action initiated and it's going to be defined as either management action with moderate or significant concern and that's the guidance on it so uh, the plan development team at that point would then be looking back to the board for direction on what does a moderate concern management response look like and crafting whatever uh, whatever that would be so just a reminder of that okay. We've got Tony and then Roy so Mike started part of what I was going to say and as as a reminder taking out the TLA is sort of like taking out reference points to the public it's not always a straightforward piece there's of information for comment um, and if and so having that disjointedness because you'll have the old management triggers in the new traffic light um, may also be a little bit confusing to the public it's okay if we need to take this time to figure out where we are we can do that and we don't have to do the traffic light response immediately we can pause in order to get this information from the public if necessary and I don't think you know and I think that it's on record and we're having this conversation that we are moving forward it's just that we're um, gathering all the information that we think we need in order to move forward um, in a logical stepwise approach okay. Robert Mr. Chairman if it pleases the board I would move to withdraw my motion then Consider it. Okay. So now we're back to where we were to start with. Um, Roy. In consideration of Robert's offer to withdraw the motion, I have to wonder do we really need an addendum to adopt the traffic light analysis? Can't we just do that? like any other tool in our toolboxes, you know, when we moved away from virtual population analysis to uh, newer updated models, we didn't, we didn't use addendum, uh, the addendum process to do that. Thank you. So if, if the board wants to adopt all of the recommendations, then an addendum would be required. And I think one of the, probably the the biggest factor in determining that is the updated triggering mechanism. Um, right now, the triggering mechanism is three consecutive years for Croker, two consecutive years for Spot, and one of the proposed recommendations from the TC is for three out of four terminal years and two out of three terminal years uh, for Croker and Spot, respectively. And because that impacts the management coming out of uh, the previous addenda that would require a new addendum. And excuse me, but I didn't follow protocol. I should have asked, was there any opposition to Mr. Boyle's removing his uh, motion? 
Hearing none. Well, Lynn. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So just one more question about this motion. So I, I think we all, as Adam said, we all agree that the new traffic light method is something we need to proceed with. If we were to approve this motion, do we need to be specific that we're going to deviate somewhat from the typical addendum process, which is, you know, the, the three meeting and, and take a little more time for public input? Do we need to specify that in the motion? Tony. If you're not ready to initiate the addendum, you don't have to do that today. You guys can, you can wait and do your public pro process, get this information, and then come back to the board and figure out how you want to move forward. You may get information from the public and decide you want to do something that requires an amendment. I, you know, I don't, it, I can't predict what the board will want to do, but you don't have to initiate. But Lynn, no, you don't have to put in the motion how you're going to, the time frame in which you do this. Oftentimes we have, we skip a meeting in between in order to can do analyses um, in order to draft the addendum. So it's just a matter of um, on record saying that here's the, the timeline that we're working on. I've got John, then Lynn, and Adam. Yeah, from trying to catch up with this and see what's going on, it definitely seems like we need to slow down and figure out what we're trying to do. I think from seeing, uh, I certainly learned more about the traffic light in relation to management just now with the fate of the substitute. And we have this early discussion that we need some sort of tap in the brakes or backstopping or general broad action perhaps. But then the traffic light seems to lend itself to more of the right here and now type of actions that the board doesn't seem to think is the appropriate move. So I think this needs a, a slower consideration to figure out what do you do with the traffic light? When the traffic light says you're triggering, what do you do? And our current plan apparently doesn't describe that well enough. But I also think as Lynn started out, there needs to be to go out and do this addendum, we need to get the feedback and we need to be on the same page, which says we, we need to know what the goal is. So if anything, it would seem that in October, we need to maybe if the states can go out and get some feedback, discuss what the goal would be of the addendum and the management and certainly one is to define what you do when you trigger a traffic light but you're going to have to put that in we'll have to put that in terms of long-term type things instead of the short term which it really seems to be geared to and to me that's that's kind of a challenge and it might take the pdt having to hear from the state feedback as to what the tolerance is or what do people even perceive as the need and then we can maybe go from there Thank you, John. Then I had Lynn and then Adam. Hi, right, Lynn. Adam? So what are the recommendations from staff versus the merits of voting this motion down, postponing it again, or adding some text to it to indicate that we in need this time to go out to the public or substitute for it to go ahead and let the public know what we're doing. Okay, Bob. Well, you know, it does sound like there's a, a consensus building to, to slow things down, think about it, and, and hear from the public a little bit. So I would almost recommend, and it's up to the group, obviously, but, but postpone this again until the annual meeting in October. And, and in the meantime, we can, you know, states can make an effort to reach out to their fishing public and see if they can see if they can find any folks that are interested in spot and croaker and get some, some feedback on that. I would suggest that we as staff try to get the AP together, or, or APs, it's one AP, one South Atlantic AP, right? Yeah, so the, the advisory panel together and, and talk about these. I also think, you know, an online survey and maybe a couple of webinars, something we, you know, sort of this multifaceted approach to reach out to the public and, and, you know, get some perspective on what's going on out there, what they would like to see as far as management, and, um, you know, bring that back to the October meeting, and then based on that knowledge, hopefully, substantial knowledge we'll be able to uh, you know this board can then decide where to go that would just be my recommendation sort of this multi-pronged approach between now and October trying to get some data and feedback from the public and, and just postpone this again until we you get back together at the annual meeting that's just hearing what you're saying that seems to be maybe a one way out okay I, I'd have a question about that do we want to postpone or do we want to vote take a you know 
turn this down and start over. I guess it, because if we postpone it, we have to bring it back up at the next meeting. Or when, you know, it's just kind of leaving it out there. We can always, we can always have a motion later on, so. Sure, yeah, I think, I think okay. either approach is similar, you know. Okay. You'll, you'll get what you get from the public and you can decide where to go at the next meeting. I had Adam and then um, Marty. I just wonder if another seven to eight weeks is enough time to get the information we need. This was initiated in May three months ago. I think it's quite clear that some of these conversations have already been occurring, but yet we don't have that information now. So I'm not sure the annual meeting would give us enough time to simply postpone till then and might encourage me to go in the direction of moving this question, voting on it, and then should it not pass, taking it up at some future date. All right, we've been going around on this, so I think, hi, Marty, your yeah, last word. I don't want to muddy the waters. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. So I, I like what Bob just suggested, and I appreciate what Adam just said. I can't speak for any other jurisdictions other than my own, but um, you know, we have this ongoing conversation with our constituents, and it's always just anything being done about Spot and Kroger, same thing over and over and over. We don't see them. They remember the heydays, and I understand this. I think they understand there's some cyclical uh, components to this, but they saw what they had at one point, and it's, it's not been good since then, and they keep asking, are you guys doing anything about this? Um, and I say it is being discussed. Um, so just from our perspective, I like what Bob said. It isn't a problem from, for, for us to, between now and the annual meeting, um, to meet with our advisors and talk to them and come back. Um, but I appreciate what Adam said, maybe for the other states, it's a little more problematic. But um, I like the idea of postponing. I'm not sure when we revisit it, um, but I'd be supportive of that. A whole bunch of hands went up. Let's go with Lynn and Roy, Chris and, yeah, Lynn. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I was just going to say that I would be in favor of voting this motion down and um, starting again and allowing us, um, you know, we have had a conversation in Maryland, but what we haven't given them, what we haven't provided is any sort of real, tangible, okay, this is actually what we could do in terms of actual regulatory ideas. And I think those are the conversations that we need to start having. And as somebody said, we may all come back and find that we're, we are considering something more appropriate for an amendment. So if, if things, if we come back with information, I think we just need to get the information and start over. I just, we just have to be committed to going forward with it. Okay. Then I had Roy. I, I thank you, Mr. Chair. I hear what Lynn is saying, and I'm also heard what Bob said. I, I'm not sure that voting this motion down sends the right message. Um, postponing action is a reasonable alternative, and in terms of proactive things we can do between now and when, when we next take up this motion again, uh, certainly we, we can cut and paste information that's already available to us to show what each state does in the way of management measures for Spot and Croker, if any, for Spot. Uh, so we can have that in front of us and be able to hand that to the general public. Um, we could have a list of potential management responses to uh, triggers being tripped. And, and we know that some, particularly for the Mid-Atlantic, already tripped using the traffic light analysis, if, presuming we, we are going to continue with the traffic light analysis. So, you know, having it on paper, r ready to d distribute to the public to get their feedback would be beneficial, I think. Uh, give them a heads up. These are our concerns. These are what these are the things we could do and have that available to us when we next take up this motion. That's kind of my recommendation. Thank you. Chris. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I think a lot of this has already been said what I was thinking, uh, but 
getting to the timing of the public hearings and when we take this back up again, uh, going back to comments I had earlier about you know, trying to characterize the fisheries uh, in, in our state, uh, in each of our states, uh, is, is going to take a little bit of time. Uh, you know, we just started talking about you know, going, reaching out to our stakeholders. From, from my perspective, I think I'll need to go back home and talk to our staff to see what's feasible. See, you know, existing meeting schedules for our advisory committees, for instance, uh, getting the information together. You know, so, I mean, again, we're you know, maybe more than tapping the brakes right now, but uh, I, th I think we need to do a little more planning to figure out the path forward as far as um, moving ahead with, with meetings. What, what's the expectation of, of, of getting these done? What we hope to get out of it? I, you know, dare, I dare say, uh, I'm almost afraid to say, you know, assembling a work group to talk about this more uh, after the after this meeting but uh, you know it, it's still I think there's still a lot of questions as far as timing overall right now all right John Please have thank you mr. chair um, I think I will be nulling out with Roy here because I think we should wait on this uh, this just reminded me of a Another cyanid whose abundance seems to be controlled by factors not related to fishing, weak fish. We took action years ago. They haven't come back. And now we get complaints about why did you cut it back the few times I'm out there. There are weak fish. I can only keep one. Uh, I mean, the public will obviously, when these actions don't bring the stock back, which they may very well not because we don't know why they are crashing. It could just be something beyond our control. So. I don't see any reason to hurry on this. Okay. All right. We will need a motion if we want to postpone again or to vote this down. So I'm not seeing any hands coming up. Call the vote. Okay. All right. This is a postponed motion from last meeting. Move to initiate the addendum to the spot croaker fishery management plans that incorporates the new traffic light analyses and the management response to those analyses. Motion by Mr. Beth Savage and seconded by Mr. Gary. Um, all those in favor, raise your right hand. Oh, this can be easy. All those against? Null votes? <laughs> Abstentions? Two. Two. The vote fails. Right. Okay. The vote fails eight. Zero. Zero to eight to one to two. All right. Well, thank you very much for that lively discussion. And we will be taking this up, and we really, you know, Everyone needs to go to their states, and, 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 and that's the key to this. We need to go out and communicate to our stakeholders that, you know, as everyone, Marty was saying, people asking what's happening with Spy and Croker, you know, why aren't we doing anything? But starting to have those conversations so we can come back to this table with some thoughts and some ideas. All right? I thank you very much for that. And we're moving on. Uh, we're going to go right through our item number six, which is lunch, because I'm sure it's not out there yet. And we'll go to item number seven, which is the update of the revised CDAR um, 58 schedule. And that's on page 36 of your materials. Mike. So as, uh, as you all are probably uh, very aware, MRIP updated their, uh, their estimates of recreational catch and landings earlier this year. Um, with that information, CDAR has decided to push back uh, the activity for the COBIA CDAR 58 uh, stock assessment. The new dates are shown up on the screen. Um, the in effect is about two months. Everything is pushed back about two months from when it was originally scheduled. Um, but the the main highlights are are shown there on the screen, and uh, the 
the date that the board would have uh, a final document ready to review and to potentially respond to would be February of 2020. So I just wanted to make the board aware of that date change. Thank you, Mike. Any questions to this? Okay. Uh, moving on to item number eight, which is the review of the COBIA uh, Technical Committee Report on Recreational Landings. So uh, our technical committee has had a lot of turnover <laughs> in, the, in the last uh, couple months especially. So we have lost both our, our chair and uh, our, we maybe uh, we could potentially have some, uh, some other movement. So right now I'm going to just give the technical committee report um, and we will have a new COBIA TC chair established uh, by, the, by the next meeting. Um, in February of this year, uh, the TC was tasked with evaluating recreational management using pounds and numbers of fish and providing a recommendation on alternative techniques. Um, one that was specifically uh, talked about was uh, done with black sea bass and looking into some smoothing techniques, things of that nature. Um, the TC addressed this with uh, three conference calls and the main conclusions from each of those calls are listed there on the screen. Um, the first one, they uh, decided that they needed more information on how uh, MRIP conducts uh, their estimation process in order to fully evaluate um, any type of uh, smoothing or outlier analysis or anything like that. Um, so the second call was a call with MRIP staff. We had Dr. Van Voorhees as well as um, John Foster and Richard Cody uh, on the phone and they answered some uh, questions about the MRIP estimation process specifically as, uh, as it pertains to COBIA. Um, upon uh, review of the, the information provided on that call, um, the, the TC was then able to form some uh, conclusions and recommendations for the board. So the TC's uh, recommendation is that if, if it is practically feasible that the uh, that management be based on numbers of fish rather than pounds. Uh, this removes additional error that's associated with either MRIP or the Southeast Fisheries Science Center, whichever um, average weight technique is being uh, considered. Um, applying an average weight, uh, especially when, when that average weight would be based on either a small sample size or a, a sample that is grouped among multiple uh, states or multiple years. Uh, the TC did not see any type of violation of MRIP survey design in 2015 or 16 when uh, COBIA recreational landings were, um, were very high. Uh, thus, there's, they don't, did not find any justification for altering these estimates uh, via smoothing or outlier techniques. And one of the main points made um, by the TC and, and that was conveyed to the TC with that call with MRIP is that if those high years are moved, you also have to give some consideration that there are low outliers um, in which the lows of 2011 or 2012 would potentially you know, be looked at for removal as well. Um, it was reiterated that MRIP is best suited for evaluating landings trends as opposed to the year-to-year -year, year -year effects. And uh, there's already been um, action taken related to COBIA through the commission uh, to account for this using the, the current three-year evaluation process as opposed to evaluating landings on that year-to-year -year basis. Uh, the TC also recommended the use of alternative metrics uh, for stock monitoring, such as those uh, from age or length data. Um, for example, uh, one of these could be evaluating trends in age distribution over time. This would require states that don't have uh, programs collecting this type of data to uh, begin collections. Um, this information would not be intended to replace any type of information coming out of MRIP uh, as far as the catch estimates, but it would be more to provide context to any management actions that are taken uh, in, uh, in response to MRIP, uh, MRIP estimates. Um, and this information was also reflected by the COBIA plan development team and it is incorporated as a topic um, 
in the plan in the uh, public information document for draft amendment one so it'll be brought up uh, later later on in our meeting today as well um, but that is the end of the TC report and I can take any questions on that any questions for Mike on this topic Chris Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I might have missed this, so I apologize in advance if I did. Uh, under the, under uh, the scenario of managing by numbers of fish, would we be converting basically the, the, the pounds in the numbers in a similar manner, how we uh, do that for black sea bass and summer flounder? Under the current FMP, um, there would need to be some type of conversion because the recreational harvest limit is in pounds. Um, so there would need to be some numbers pounds conversion there. Um, but I think that the kind of the spirit of the TC's tasking was for more of the longer term view and, and in light of the draft amendment uh, that, is, that is underway right now, um, the potential to change the management regime from an evaluation of a coastwide poundage limit to something else and if if that you know if that be uh, some type of numbers limit or something like that then um, the but the TC was more trying to say that uh, the the effect of the harvest is better evaluated by the numbers of fish that are removed uh, by the fishery rather than the poundage there's more associated uh, more error associated with the poundage Oops, sorry I, um, any other questions for Mike on this? All right, let's move forward. Um, up to item number nine, which is um, consider the draft public information document from amend Amendment 1 for COBIA uh, for public comment. And Mike, you have the floor again. This is page 39 of your materials, if you're following along. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And um, so first, I'm going to just do a uh, review of the amendment process, where we are um, in our timeline. And then I'll go into some of the, the items uh, talked about in the public information document. So uh, the first step of our amendment process is a public information document. It's, a, it's, uh, it's the commission's way of scoping. Um, and that provides the public the opportunity to identify issues, management alternatives, uh, contribute to any type of topics that are not currently being considered, um, they're able to provide input in that way. Uh, after the public information document um, has gone out, public hearings are held, um, and then a draft amendment uh, is, is then developed in light of the information that's received during those initial public hearings. The draft amendment is a more focused document which uh, lays out a suite of options and those options can then be uh, selected for the final uh, for the final amendment. There is a, uh, another public another opportunity for the public to comment on the uh, the options that are listed in the draft amendment as well before final board review. The timeline that we're currently on uh, for this for draft amendment one um, is to have a final board review in August of 2019. In the aftermath of this meeting, should uh, this document be approved for public comment, uh, we would hold public hearings um, in, in the time period between now and annual meeting, and there would be a review of the public comment at annual meeting. The written public comment period would begin uh, shortly after um, we're uh, shortly after this meeting, as long as there, uh, there's time there to incorporate any changes that the board has for the public information document, um, we would then send that out and we would begin uh, scheduling public hearings. The dates that you see there for the public hearings are approximate, and that would and there is some uh, flexibility in those depending on whether we need to have uh, the public comment summary completed in time for briefing or supplemental materials. Um, in the next meeting, but that would be uh, around the time frame in that mid-September uh, area that we would uh, we would be looking to schedule public hearings in the various states. So, 
So the issues that are covered by the PID as of now are uh, recommended management for federal waters, a harvest specification process, and uh, biological monitoring. Um, the board is able uh, at this meeting to add or to edit these topics before the PID goes out for public comment. And I'll give a bit of background on each of these issues and then pose some of the questions that are listed in the PID that we're hoping to get board and public input on. The first topic is uh, recommended management for federal waters. Uh, the motivation for this is that several of the uh, several of the management measures that are listed in the current FMP are directly tied to a federal FMP. For example, the RHL. Um, is set equivalent to 99% of and monitored concurrently with the recreational allocation of the federal ACL. Uh, with uh, the action that has been taken by the Gulf and South Atlantic Councils, um, they've, uh, they've approved the removal of Atlantic Cobia from the Coastal Migratory Pelagics FMP, and that's now pending um, secretarial review. But should the secretary uh, approve uh, that removal as well, there would no longer be a federal plan for COBIA. So that, uh, that federal ACL for Atlantic COBIA would no longer exist and um, would need to be replaced with something else. The Atlantic Coastal Act allows uh, the commission to recommend measures for promulgation in federal waters. No fisheries would be the body that implements these measures. Um, there's a need to address both commercial and recreational measures in the FMP. There's been a lot of focus um, with the Cobia fishery on the recreational side of things, but there are both commercial and recreational measures that would need to be addressed in, uh, in a draft amendment. Uh, there's a list for both the recreational and commercial fisheries of the uh, measures, the types of measures that are currently in place, and those are some of the things that could be considered uh, for implementation in federal waters. One of the big questions is the process of how these implementation these uh, these measures should be implemented in uh, in federal waters. For example, should separate measures be considered for federal versus state waters? Uh, should state regulations be essentially extended latitudin latitudinally by sectioning off portions of federal waters with different regulations? Or should vessels fishing in federal waters be subject to regulations of their state of landing or some other type of method of implementation? That's a, a question that we're posing to the board and to the public for input. The second topic covered in the PID is the harvest specification process. Um, there's, uh, a, there's been a board desire to consider alternative management strategies to a uh, coast-wide quota type of system that is, uh, that's in place right now. Um, and CDAR 58 is underway. It will be uh, released along the timeline that was specified earlier. And so this harvest specification process would really allow the board uh, the ability to select from a range of management measures and respond to the assessment as well as um, potentially move away from, uh, from a coast-wide quota type of system if that is the board's desire. Um, this specification process would need to be established for, again, both commercial and recreational uh, fisheries for COBIA. And there are several questions listed in the PID along this, but um, some of those to highlight are uh, what measures should be considered with this uh, specification process, how often should measures be set, uh, should they be set on an annual basis, or right now there's, a, there's kind of a three-year evaluation process of landings should uh, that, that time frame be applied to a harvest specification process. Um, should there be a, an annual harvest limit for both or either fishery? Should uh, harvest be evaluated in pounds or numbers? And then there are uh, some questions about uh, commercial permitting that have, uh, that have been raised. And they were somewhat inherited with the Cobia fishery um, as it's being transferred to the commission from the council in the sense that there's some uh, there, there's some confusion about uh, what defines a commercial fisherman when it pertains to cobia. Um, are, the, are commercial, f and th this is an area that we would probably look towards uh, the board and 
uh, those states that have had confusion along the lines of their commercial permitting for input on what should be done at the state level versus what should be done at the commission level um, along those lines. The final topic that is addressed in the PID is uh, biological monitoring. It was brought up by the technical committee uh, in evaluating the, the impact of recreational landings. Um, and the gist of it is, again, to provide context to the board in response to, uh, in response to well, in addition to landings information um, that would also give some information on the, the health of the stock. And this would, uh, this could potentially be implemented through biological monitoring requirements as are seen in other, uh, other FMPs. So a question uh, posed to the board and the public is should the FMP require biological sampling? Um, for which fisheries should that be required? And what would the requirements or the specifications of this sampling process be? Um, and finally, just kind of a coverall, um, if the board has any other issues that are not addressed in the public information document that you would like to see added, um, those are things that, uh, that can be discussed and, and added in the aftermath of this meeting. And yeah, that's all I have. Thank you very much, Mike. And Robert has his hand up. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mike, great presentation. Um, you know, brave new world as we, we enter into this, um, this realm with Cobia management. Uh, I just wanted to put on record, I, I'm a little concerned about the requirements for biological monitoring with respect to, you know, this is a rarely encountered species. Um, I, I, I certainly don't dispute the fact that we need to have some provisions to get a handle on what's going on with the stock. Uh, but I am concerned about um, sampling availability. and. Um, uh, you know, I would submit to you there, you know, South Carolina anglers um, and certainly our staff, you know, have spent a lot of time in the water chasing cobia, um, sometimes to um, little avail, and I just would hate to get us painted in that box. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Robert, I think some of that was think along the lines of maybe um, the carcass recovery program that's in Georgia, the freezer programs that we have in Virginia. So those kind of things where it's, it's by opportunity. I, you know, if states have those kind of programs already, maybe adding these, adding cobia to that list of species that can be collected through that program. So that, that's one option that's relatively, if the state already has one of those programs, relatively easy to, to initiate for the species. Any other comments or additions? Krista? So this is pretty minor. Um, would it be possible to get um, Atlantic or Atlantic Migratory Group or something like that into the title of the document just to alleviate any confusion? Um, I know that it's in the first paragraph of the document, but I think it would be great to have that in the title. That can be done. Thank you. Any other comments? Any additions? Anybody wants to add to the PID? Okay, we need to have an action on this to, uh, do we want to consider this, um, for public, this PID. Not seeing any hands go up. <laughs> Lynn? Thank you, Mr. Chair. You need a motion. I would move to approve the PID. There we go. That. <laughs> I see a lot of hands go up. <laughs> it's getting close to lunch. Um, seconded by Spud Woodward. So um, move to approve the public information document for the draft amendment one to the Kobe Fishery Management Plan for public comment. A motion by Ms. Fagley, seconded by Mr. Woodward. Um, Hearing no opposition, um, approved by consent. Okay. All right. Thank you for that. I am going to, for in the, in the sake of time, I'm going to, if, unless somebody has an objection to it, uh, item number ten. I, I what? Mean, Did I, what? We need to like specify approved. Specify what? Oh, uh, it was. I'm sorry. I have to say that it was approved without objection. I apologize. 
There we go. Thank you. Um, if there's no objections, item number 10, the uh, Fisheries Management Plan Reviews and State Compliance Reports for Croker and Red Drum, I'm going to suggest we approve those via email. Any objections to that? Okay. Approved by. What's the term? I'll be on the motion. Okay. All right. So we're going to move on to um, item number 11. Is, is Tina here? We have a, um, a nomination for a new um, AP member from Virginia, Craig Freeman. You want me to do it? Uh, we have a new member, uh, Craig Freeman. He's an advisory panel member. Um, you have it in his, his information in your, um, in your packet. Uh, Joe Semino, when he was at Virginia, kindly recommended him. And so we need to approve him to the, um, the advisory panel. So I need a, a motion. Joe? I think it's only fitting, Mr. Chair. I, I move to approve Mr. Freeman. As you can see from the packet, he really checks all the boxes here. I, th I think he'd be a great addition. Okay. Do we have a second to that? Lynn Fagley. Okay. So move to approve Craig Freeman as a member of the South Atlantic Board Advisory Panel. Motion by Mr. Semino. Seconded by Ms. Fagley. Um, any opposition to this motion? Okay. Motion is carried. All right, getting us back on schedule. Um, the last item we have on our, <coughs> excuse me, um, is um, election of a vice chair. Mr. Woodward. Thank you, Mr. Chair. It's my privilege to nominate the sage of the Low Country, Robert Bowles, Jr. <laughs> Second the motion by uh, Mr. Heyman. Uh, we will close nominations. Any oppositions? Um, welcome on board, Robert, and I look forward to many Jeffersonian and some Frank, like the Lombardi for COVID. But he, he, he did. No, same state. Oh, same I'm sorry. Malcolm, I apologize for that. I didn't know I had to be the same state. What? Okay. Well, thank you again, Robert. <laughs> We appreciate it. Is there any other business to come before the board? Hearing none, all right. So um, main things, you know, I want everyone to go back to your states, talk about Spot and Croker. Um, as far as the um, PID, please, as soon as possible, talk to Mike about scheduling public um, hearing dates. Do that as soon as possible. And you'll be getting an email from us concerning um, the Red Drum and Atlantic Croker um, approval of the management plans and state, of, state compliance. Is there anything else to come before this board? Mike. Sorry, just one more thing. This was at the end of the Red Drum presentation, so that's why it wasn't uh, addressed directly. Um, the uh, assessment Science Committee tasks the Red Drum Stock Assessment Subcommittee with uh, with several pieces of guidance coming out of the last Red Drum assessment. Um, there's been quite a bit of changeover for the Red Drum Stock Assessment Subcommittee, so that needs to be repopulated um, so that they can start addressing some of the some of the guidance from the ASC. That's something that can be taken care of by email, um, but I just wanted to make you aware of that. Um, we're going to be looking at particularly areas for um, tagging information as well as the use of stock synthesis related to red drum. So uh, please be mindful of that. Watch out for your email and, and talk to your uh, state scientists or anybody else that you'd be interested in putting on that SAS. Okay, anything else? All right, um, motion to adjourn. Thank you.